So thank you everybody for uh, coming along to uh, this week's Magnet Seminar. Um, we've got a little bit of a, a slightly different seminar from our traditional uh, uh, purely science talks this week. So I'm really looking forward uh, to, to today's presentation. Um, for those who haven't um, been to one of our seminars before, uh, we typically will have a presentation that's about 25 to 30 minutes long or so. So we kindly ask that you keep your uh, microphones muted um, so as not to interrupt the speaker. Uh, if you are having problems with your connection, uh, we recommend turning off um, your camera and that can help to, to improve the connection. At the end of the seminar, we'll have time for a sort of 10 to 15 minute um, question and discussion session. Um, you're, we'll invite you to unmute your microphones to, to ask your questions. If you don't want to, to, to use your microphone, you type a question into the chat uh, and I will read it out um, to, to the presenters. And at the very end of all this, we have time for a bit of a social catch up. This is not recorded and this is just a chance for us to all uh, catch up and have a bit more of a, of a friendly discussion uh, at the end of it all. Uh, so today I'm, I'm really quite pleased to announce that we have uh, Lewis Braddock Clark and Susanna uh, Zygiewska, I apologize if I've said that wrong, um, from the Royal Academy of, of Art in The Hague. And today they're going to be presenting out of focus uh, paleomagnetic listening. So I'll hand over to um, the presenters. Awesome. Okay, uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, yeah, we'd like to thank Anik van der Boon, first of all, and the whole Magnetic team for inviting us here this evening. It's a real special opportunity for us to also have this type of context and everyone here joining online. So thanks for being here. Um, yeah, as Greg said already, we are Louis and Susanna. We're both lecturers at the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague. And we work together also as an artist duo in The Hague. So we run like a studio practice here. As uh, researchers and creative practitioners, we survey the landscapes of geological anomalies, anthropogenic displacement, and different types of techno cultures. Uh, we use original and experimental techniques to challenge and explore the boundaries of also documentary filmmaking in times of these accelerated geographies. And today we're gonna to share insights uh, of our recent field research on Mitri Island, which is in the northwestern part of Greenland, and the results of an art scientific experiments done in collaboration with the Paleomagnetic Laboratory at the Utrecht University. So our new project is Out of Focus. It's a kind of audiovisual experience exploring climate change, mineral extraction, paleomagnetism, and post-colonialism in Northern Greenland. And we look at this through the changes in geomagnetism and digital storytelling. Um, so this presentation will take you down the crimson cliffs, past the fjord of the dead and over the signal mountain. A harpoon of light cuts through the heavens. The night sky turns to fire, a sound of a thousand whales. Arne Kitsuk, woman, dog, Havik one, Tura, Havik two, and Ak Parerik smash into the sleepy landscape of Inna Minaman. As they hit the ice, their memories melt away. The walking stones forget where they come from, willing to offer their spirits to a new ground. I touch the walking stones when they sleep. Their cold, shiny bodies breathe and pulse. These masses of metal appear to be very heavy. By their journey, they speak of the stars, the sky, the fire. By their color, dark night. And by their density, the cohesion of terrestrial things. Their liveliness excites me to morph them further. I scupped urus, knives, and harpoon heads. In Salambo, a novel from 1862, Gustave Flaubert poetically portrays, quote, the abadirs, stones which had fallen from the moon, whirling in slings of silver thread, unquote. Meteorites have inspired generations of artists, poets, and filmmakers, and also scientists, to dream about other worlds and reflect on human positioning within the universe. Around 10,000 years ago, a meteor shower hit the grounds of the present-day Cape York Peninsula in Northern Greenland. The fragments of walking stones spread across the crimson cliffs, past the Fjord of the Dead and over the Signal Mountain. 
In Out of Focus, our new project, we explore the unique ability of these ion meteorites to lock in magnetic information. As an ion meteoroid burns through the Earth's atmosphere, it heats up above its Curie temperature. This 570 degrees Celsius hot spell rewrites the stone's magnetic data to match the earthly parameters and simultaneously erasing the information about its cosmic origin. These special powers of storing, erasing and overwriting data gave ion meteorites the nicknames of hard drives from space. And this geological anomaly of falling stars sparked a technological advancement in the Arctic. The people of Northern Greenland called Inuruit mined valuable ores from the extraterrestrial material. Using basalt stones as hammers, they would chip off meteorite fragments to model their devices. With every, cl every clang, bang and dong, they would unknowingly cause stress magnetism effect changing the properties of the mineral. And alongside this technological application, the cultural significance of meteorites flourished in myths and drum songs. Inspired, the Inuit gave names to the walking stones who became protagonists of these stories. Inspired by this idea of breeding spirits into the meteorites, Arne Kitsok, woman, dog, Havik 1, Tura, Havik 2, and Akparirik reappear as non human characters in Out of Focus. Through a series of art scientific experiments in the Arctic and at the Paleomagnetic Laboratory in Utrecht, samples of Cape York meteorites are demagnetized and then magnetized to measure. The process of gathering and reshaping the geomagnetic data in meteorites is as follows. So first we obtain the samples of Cape York meteorites. Um, then second, um, the local Inuit um, who are called uh, the Arctic Highlanders, these hunters, they take these samples and heat them up to their Curie point with a simple blowtorch. Uh, third, we measure the local geomagnetic field and its anomalies with a magnetometer. And then uh, we take the meteorite samples to the Earth Simulation Lab at Utrecht University, where um, Leonard Bick prepares them to be measured. Uh, so yeah, cuts them and processes them. Uh, and then at the Paleomagnetic Laboratory in Utrecht, we measure the samples magnetic values using a spinner magnetometer. Uh, the experiment in the lab is done also um, in collaboration with uh, Lennart uh, de Groot and uh, Rosa de Boer. Um, and finally, we uh, demagnetize new samples uh, of the meteorite and remagnetize them according to the red values of the samples blowtorched in Greenland. Uh, so, yeah, in short, we take the samples that we uh, changed in Greenland with the help of local hunters to Holland and based on the measurings, the measurements, we uh, change other samples to have the same type of magnetism. Um, yeah, so what it means for our narrative is that in this process of rewriting the meteorites magnetic histories, we create new stories. Okay, now we're kind of like switching between each other. Uh, so now I'll just unmute myself. Okay. In the past, the Havahimuk, people of great irons, decapitated the women meteorite and sledged its head away. This act maddened the weather demon, Tupelak, who pierced a crack through the ice sheet, swallowing the heavenly stone. The thieves narrowly escaped death, but learned that nature shelters its own deposits. Today, mining companies drill out, cut off, and measure up mineral samples. As a result of climate change, the deposits previously hidden under the ice cap in Greenland are now revealed. The prospects of acquiring new land with, quote, the most interesting assets and vast deposit potentials, unquote, inspire new mining startups to dig and explore. Prices of minerals shrink and expand like the Arctic ice. The licenses for digging become investments for global players who bet in favor of the unfolding ecological catastrophe. 
In this landscape of speculation, an uncertain climate may liquefy into cash flow. The melting of ice only encourages the extractive mechanism present in this landscape for centuries. Parallel to Danish colonization, the 19th century North Pole expeditions, such as those led by American Robert Perry, set out to find and retrieve mineral trophies. In this process, the Greenlandic meteorites found their ways to museums in New York and Copenhagen. So here you can kind of see these photos uh, which we've taken from archives, which show the meteorite being taken to Copenhagen and to New York. And there are some really incredible stories about this whole process because it's an incredibly heavy object also. <laughs> uh, this relocation of heaven stones also aligned with the displacement of the Inuit people who guided their cherished resources to the Western shorelines. Parallel to the extraction of the Anikitsuk meteorite, Perry took a group of Greenlanders to New York. The indigenous people were disgracefully displayed as a living anthropological zoo at the American Museum of Natural History. A century later, after a series of evictions instigated by the colonial powers, forced migration is now prompted by new mining adventures. Dredgers, bulldozers, earth augers, oil drums, and diesel generators creep into the settlements and nomadic hunting grounds. And yet, the traditional Inuit way of life is not only threatened by mining. During a cafe meek on Mitri Island, a cafe meek is like a kind of casual coffee and cake session. Um, the elder Karnak Nilsson shared his thoughts about the dangers of the erratic climate. And so this is a quote. These animals, polar bears and narwhals come and go. They are living together with the weather. One winter they are here and the next winter they are not here. The weather is very unstable. Hunting nowadays is hard and tiring, especially for those who rely on it. The locals do not only depend on wildlife as a source of food, but also consider hunting rituals as the breathing heart of their identity. Climate instability disrupts the traditional way of life of the Inuit by leaving them to a tragic choice between the life-threatening danger of hunting on thin ice or the kind of distress of employment in the post-colonial power structure. For the Greenlandic society, the live geology of the land can either become a garden or a grave. The auctioning of mineral licenses contributes to a level of political and economic independence from Denmark. In this view, Greenland's natural heritage shifts from common good to commodity. And by doing so, the garden of metals would become liberated from the post-colonial power, but then sliced open by foreign mineral extraction. And these types of dilemmas are kind of constantly going on in uh, this part of Greenland, which we were kind of experiencing when we were there. Okay, let me switch again, is it? <laughs> um, Anirnik means breath, Anirnit, many breaths, Hila, a breath of life. The spirit of every living being is borrowed from the sky and the air around them. I am a seal. I inhale the frosty ghosts to guard me underwater. I seek out a beautiful harpoon head in order to exhale my life without pain. If the design follows the rule of ritual and custom, my spirit will reside in the harpoon head for one night after my death. The indigenous cosmology animates the landscape as a breathing system. According to the Inuit, the breaths, meaning spirits, of all living beings are borrowed from Hila, which stands for the weather, climate, consciousness, and mind, and many other things. In the moment of death, bodies return their breaths back to the landscape. This exchange of spirits portrays nature as a network of interconnected parts. In Northern Greenland, the cycles of life and death are experienced daily at the edge of the sea ice, at the breathing holes, on dock sledges, and in kayaks. Traditionally and still to this day, the Inuit use iron harpoons for hunting. According to a myth recorded in 1929 by the Greenlandic Danish anthropologist Knut Rasmussen, quote, the soul of a seal resides in the harpoon head for one night after the seal has been killed. Unquote. 
For the Inuruit, this hunting tool is not a weapon, but a device to facilitate the passage of breaths from one body to another. The contemporary Norwegian ethnographer Hans Christian Gulloff describes a harpoon to be a, quote, medium of continuity between living beings, unquote. Making harpoon heads out of extraterrestrial metal, the Inuruit envisioned the capacity of iron meteorites to lock in magnetic data. Inspired by the Inuruit relationship with the landscape, ruled by weather demons, staggering rocks, and exchanges of breaths, our project Out of Focus proposes a new reading of the Greenlandic tormented tundra. The indigenous idea of Hila, connecting all living things, finds its contemporary expression in spectral data woven out of geomagnetic waves. Our custom-made microphones, geotools, we call them, um, detect magnetic anomalies caused by climate change and mineral displacement. Each of our magne magnetometers consists of a three-axis flux gate sensor and an electronic circuit. The data output, amplified by the shifting geomagnetism, is converted into a sonic representation. This allows for listening live to the spectral tundra. And by immersing in these sounds, we would like to challenge the colonial extractive relationship with the Arctic landscape. Um, yeah, and additionally, the fragments of walking stones, as the Inuruit people call them, uh, shipped out of Greenland by colonists and explorers, will return to the Arctic landscape. The restitution of mineral trophies is followed by the procedure of inserting a new magnetic moment into a meteorite sample. Organized in collaboration with the Havichivik community, all hunters, elders, artisans, shamans, and children are involved in this ritual. With a simple blowtorch, a meteorite fragment is heated up above its curie point. The hot spell erases the stone's magnetic history. On an alchemical level or metaphorical level, um, the colonial weight is lifted, triggering, triggering a new opening. And now we switch to Louis. Yeah, I actually, I have the, the magnetometers that we've been building for the last two years. Maybe it's also interesting to show live. So you saw in the photo, um, it's kind of like this yellow box. I don't know if you can see it there. Yeah. And what we do is we, build the circuit uh, with a GPS, so which is really handy because then we know where we're collecting the data. And at the same time, we have this kind of customized electronic circuit with a little screen, a GPS, and like a microcontroller. And then connected to this box, we have, yeah, the geotool. And most of you probably know the magnetometer from this like Barrington, uh, this kind of like little tube with like three axis flux gates inside. It's a similar thing to that, but we kind of customized the housing to be completely different. And then these are the flux gate sensors. And so what we do is when we're in Greenland, we have, I think, three or four of these devices. Um, they're all 3D printed. And then we walk through the terrain with the Inuit people uh, measuring the geomagnetic values of it. So, and we do this for a few hours each day. So it's not like cyclic, but it's just more like momentary readings of the intensity. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're on this like final chapter right now. We believe that immersive methods of storytelling evoke a deeper emotional response compared to scientific visualizations of just pie charts and data percentages. In Geomorphic Video 2017, art theorist Ursula Byman calls for an urgency of embodied interpretation of scientific data. She says, quote, it is fairly easy to access vast amounts of scientific data about the climate and environment, but the explanation of data cannot alone help us to understand the magnitude of the change ahead of us. Aesthetics that are capable of reaching the imaginary will be necessary, and these often caught a fictional status. So for us, after reading this quote, we were really encouraged by the words of Byman for our kind of project out of focus about this idea of material imaginaries that step beyond uh, scientific communication. So also finding ways to work with data and science and these phenomena of geomagnetism 
but in more kind of uh, artistic communication senses. So our custom magnetometer uh, instruments convey the landscape's expression beyond kind of the binaries of zero and one. Through these combined lenses of art and science, the viewer can immerse themselves in this kind of spectral polyphony of disruptive geology. And that's like the idea of listening and being completely surrounded by all these sounds of the landscape. Ice carving thunders, narwhal electro clicking, frantic beluga sopranos, nomadic radio chatter, helicopter blades clapping and hunting boat rumbles tune the listeners further into the accelerated geography. Let me switch again. So, um, and some words about our uh, cinematic and artistic methods, um, which align with uh, Bruno Latour's criticism of anthropogenic aesthetics. So in uh, the verifiable image of the world, 2019, he writes, quote, we are so accustomed to seeing our blue planet from the outside in, as if we were imprisoned in a raucous space station or sitting on the throne of God, that we have completely forgotten to what extent this astronomical image of the world poorly reflects the common habitat shared by the living, unquote. Looking at the earth from above creates this illusion of separation in which the viewer seemingly does not participate in the object of viewing that is the shifting landscape. This way of seeing certainly remains a deception as humans are part of nature and earth is their habitat. Surprisingly, even when artistically addressing the issues of the Anthropocene, many methods and tools are identical to those used in landscape ex extraction. Sorry. Drone filming, satellite mapping, and remote sensing. In this way, the images of ecolog ecological disasters fall into a category of horrifying but sublime aesthetics. Examples range from the epic drone shots of ice carving to the captures of fluorescent toxic tailings. And admitting Latour's criticism of probing the earth outside in, our strategy is to trace the evidence of shifting landscape from the inside out. Through listening to the sounds of fluctuating geomagnetic fields, the crew is guided across the terrain. In this way, the sonic maps conduct a dramaturgy of navigating in space, composing the audiovisual narrative. This approach invites the landscape to speak, scream and stutter. Applying this perspective of object-oriented ontology by looking through the material lenses of the landscape, the project constructs a narrative that shifts away from the colonial framing. Besides physical conquest, uh, the Danish and American colonists constructed their own hierarchical interpretations of the Greenlandic landscape and culture. And to bypass these biased perspectives, the fragments of Cape York Meteorite become important non-human storytellers and story triggers throughout the project. Yeah, so not only in our project, we kind of have these sound dialogues with the landscape and objects and the meteorites, but the artistic materialities are always explored in relation to the humans. So to the people who actually live there, to ourselves also who come there. Um, so the project becomes also a platform that gives voice to the Inuit people who are directly bound with the landscape. Um, so our communication with the local community was made possible by the Kanak hunter and rock and roll musician, uh, Alakatsiak Perry, who when we actually went to Greenland, we didn't have a, a translator. And we spent like, I don't know, three or four days making quick posters and putting them on uh, shops saying, hey, we need a translator so that we can actually also communicate with people who live there. And it turned out that Alakatsiak Perry, who decided to be our translator, he was the great, great grand uh, son of Robert Perry, who was actually the American explorer who went to the North Pole and had bought the Cape York meteorite Anakitsok back to New York in 1897. So that was like also like a little side story there. Um, and this is him with his like rock and roll band right near the top of Greenland. <laughs> um, yeah, so over the last seven months, the stories narrated by the people of the Great Irons have been translated from Inukton to English by Miyuki Deirana from Kanak. And so the language is only speaking by less than 900 people. So it's been also a real mission 
to find ways of translating this language also into English because a lot of the words have plural meanings. And uh, yeah, Miyuki Deron has been doing an amazing job with us. And she has a background in uh, anthropology, specializing in the Anthropocene also. And this really contributes to building a climate aware narrative from an Inuit position. Uh, additionally, the efforts to transcribe and translate spoken accounts contribute also to the preservation of the Inuktitut language, which is vanishing. And like I said, spoken by very few people. Um, yeah, and actually that's kind of the end of our presentation, kind of, but we thought it would be really fun to play for everyone here, a five minute audio recording, which kind of narrates our own experiences of being on this island for a month. And so the audio recording has sounds of, uh, let's say, it's not data sonification, but it's taking this magnetometer recordings and turning it into sound. Um, there's field recordings in there, so it's a real journey of sound. So if you have headphones, it'd be great if you could plug headphones in and I will just go ahead and play the sounds. So thank you for listening. <laughs>
ana ni hakuh kak tak tak kau dah matu kau ira ikam luang ira kita Yeah, that was it. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Lewis and, and Susanna. We can um, give them both a, a, a round of applause there for uh, a really interesting and, and very different talk from our usual uh, scientific fair. It was really good. Thank you. So we have um, some time for for uh, questions. If anybody has any questions uh, to throw at uh, Lewis or, or Susanna. So I know we have one in the chat which came uh, early on from uh, from William Harbert, um, who was asking, "Are you using uh, ESRIs or story maps in in your work, um, and will you create a, a sort of story map version um, of the insights that you have had?" Uh, story map, yeah. I mean, at the end, so what we've actually just presented is pure research and kind of more experiential like things happening in the moment and so at the end I guess it, it won't be a story map but it will be a film so it will actually be a formal one hour documentary slash art film slash science film um, and we'll be distributing that also so we'll invite everyone to come and watch that film when it's finished and we can't say when it will be finished because we've also decided to go back to Greenland this summer and spend more time there, making recordings, listening to sounds, and just being there in the landscape. That's really important for us. So we'll let you know when the film is released and everyone can come and see it back in the <laughs> cinemas. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really good. Um, does anybody else have uh, any questions? I've got a bundle, um, but I don't want to, I don't want to take over. I have a question as well. Uh, um, yeah, that's so cool. Um, really different from what we see normally, but it's so awesome. It's the first time I listened to paleomagnetic data, I think. So I was wondering, because your, your sound thing was multiple sounds over each other. And I was wondering which one were like the, the recordings from the geomagnetic field? Was that like the bass sound or? Yeah, and also these, these other oh, sounds. Wow. Yeah. And uh, yeah, some we also picked up some um, we, we, we what we believe to be a Morse code from uh, American um, Air Base, which is uh, yeah the closest settlement to the yeah to, to the settlement we were um, we were at. Um, and besides that, yeah, in, indeed, it's um, a lot of field field recordings um, with uh, the use of also hydrophone and other microphones. So um, yeah. So these all these layers are combined into one, so to say, sound, soundscape. And uh, I also wanted to add that um, some sounds were made by the hunters who were using our geo tools and also exploring the landscape. So uh, um, yeah, we wanted to kind of uh, collaborate with them and not to perhaps only document their life. Uh, so so we we also really believe that they are part of uh, the authors of the project in in some way. Yeah. Yeah. So also the it's maybe we didn't cover it also in the sounds is the flux gate magnetometer, which we kind of built ourselves. That's translating the 
fluctuations, I guess, with a really high sample rate. So it's very fast reading. And then we also, we have a, a basically in the landscape, we have a big dipole antenna, which is like two probes of aluminium that go into the permafrost. And it's, I think it's called, someone can correct me actually, probably, but it's magnetotelluric measuring. Um, so we have this giant dipole on the ground and that's when I think we picked up all these kind of uh, natural radio signals, the military base, all this other stuff because of the noise. Um, but so we were, we're trying all these different kind of scientific techniques also in the kind of idea of listening purely. Well, thanks very much. Um, I mean, I guess if nobody else has got a question, my, my, my question really is, um, what inspired you to, to look at um, the, the magnetic fields and, and, and the magnetization, the memory in rocks? I mean, what was the kind of spark that set you off down this road? Yeah, actually, we, we made a film uh, before, uh, which was looking at a very specific case study, which was the port of Rotterdam. And we were really interested in the port of Rotterdam because we'd heard that the port of Rotterdam had become this uh, local mag magnetic anomaly. And the reason for that was the fact that um, giant iron ore mines in uh, Baffin Island, Canada, and in Brazil had been digging up all the raw material and then dumping it in the port of Rotterdam to then later on be turned into steel in Germany. And by putting this huge island of iron ore in the middle of the port of Rotterdam had created this kind of local anomaly. Uh, so we were really interested in trying to make a project about this kind of invisible phenomena and how we also come from a design practice. So we're also really interested in how things can be communicated. Uh, we're interested in language. We're interested in this kind of variety of things. So we were always fascinated with how can you communicate invisible phenomena? It's like almost the biggest challenge. <laughs> Uh, so that, I think mean, that's also the exciting thing. And for us, it's also a lot down to interpretation, things that are uh, anomalies. That's also an attraction. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of for us, I guess. Maybe you can add something, Zuzo. Yeah, that's, that's actually what I wanted to say. So we, we come from visual communication uh, kind of background. And uh, yeah, primarily we were quite concerned with images only and then uh, I think um, yeah I mean everything is waves so then it expands into uh, this quest of trying to understand how to map other waves and how can we um, yeah how can we reach uh, understanding of them and, uh, and what does it give to us what kind of data it can uh, or like what kind of information is hidden in that so uh, yeah also hence the, the interest in the uh, yeah, climate change and um, mineral extraction and how um, that affects also people um, yeah and for us also this aspect of uh, indigenous cosmology this that um, sees the, the, the cosmos in quite similar way um, as we see geomagnetism nowadays. So um, this world woven out of uh, invisible waves and also, I mean, yeah, high Arctic is uh, uh, completely dark half of the year. So I think these imaginaries of what we can't see become very prominent. So yeah, we kind of became fascinated by all these aspects together, I think. and. Um, yeah, combining them, um, but then also being open for serendipity uh, going to Greenland because uh, some things we could not uh, foresee and um, were quite surprising to us. So um, yeah, that's just the way we work. Um, yeah. Okay, so thanks very much. Um, I think we've got time for one, uh, one other quick question if, if anybody has, has one. No, well, okay, I'll have, I'll have one very quick, well, hopefully very quick. But, and, you know, when you're actually doing the readings with the magnetometer, you said you sort of walked around some areas where, you know, were you just focused around just the local villages that you were at, or did you actually go, you know, walk around further afield sort of thing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we had like a base camp, I guess, <laughs> where we would leave the magnetometer 
for like a 24 hour cycle. So you'd have that kind of longevity of a kind of baseline data. And I think that was something like 58,000 nanoteslas we were getting from this kind of like baseline data. And then what we wanted to do is, yeah, like we said before, we really love anomalies. That's for us is the <laughs> interesting thing. So we had this kind of theory that potentially meteorite craters where the meteorite had fallen, maybe it left some remnant magnetism or maybe there were other things happening there or how could we also look for geological features like um, a magnetite outcrop of geology? Would that also be a, a kind of anomaly in relation to the base level? So we put all these devices in movement to kind of explore the terrain by trying to listen for these anomalies, basically. So that's when you hear the sound going, like going crazy, that's the anomaly <laughs> because the flux gate just can't handle that kind of high field. Yeah. So it was really an exploration. And I think that was really beautiful for the project is we didn't have like a map or coordinates. It's like we'd go out on these hunting boats and just try and like guide ourselves through geomagnetism fields, basically. <laughs> Cool, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can give um, um, uh, Lewis and Zuzana another uh, round of applause for a really uh, different and really quite interesting uh, talk. Thank you, guys. It was really good. Um, so just before we wrap up um, for um, for the evening, apologies for some background noise here, and um, just a, a, a quick reminder um, of uh, some of our upcoming uh, seminars we've got two more seminars um, in May, in, in a couple of weeks' time and in a month's time. And then we have a short break um, over the EGU uh, week. And then we will come back um, to a slightly different time slot. So we'll switch to uh, a European Eastern Hemisphere time slot. So our seminars will move to uh, a morning time slot uh, in, in, in the European uh, hemisphere. Um, and as always, we are uh, looking for uh, more speakers. So if anybody is interested in giving a, a scientific talk, a, a, an artistic talk, or any kind of talk that is um, uh, magnetic in any way, um, please reach out to us uh, and let us know and we can we can arrange you into to our schedule. And lastly, just a quick reminder that today's seminar and uh, all of the previous seminars that we've had um, are, will be available on, on our YouTube channel. So if you missed out on anything today or anything in the past, please look us up on, on YouTube to, to catch up. So thank you everyone for um, joining this week's Magnets and I look forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks time. Thank you all very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>